Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk, the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Vicky Davis, aka Cool Cat Teacher on Twitter, who is the host of the 10 Minute Teacher podcast uh, and also one of LinkedIn's top education voices 2020. And I'm sure I've missed a few other things. Teacher as well, Vicky. Um, good morning here, uh, or good afternoon uh, for me. Good morning to you in Georgia, America. How are you? I am excellent. It's a joy to see you. We've known each other for uh, online for quite some time. And it's yeah, nice we're to just saying, listeners, uh, easily 10 plus years. Uh, now, Vicky, you started blogging uh, as a teacher 2005, you mentioned. Uh, could you just give us yes. maybe a reason why? Well, I went to the GAETC conference. Uh, it's a conference here in Georgia. Um, a man named David Warlick, who many of you there would have heard of, um, spoke about blogging and podcasting and all of these things and I wanted to bring it to my classroom but before I teach things I want to understand them myself so I started blogging so that I could turn around and teach my students and mm -hmm. somehow people started reading it was more of a surprise to me than anybody else and I was like well hey there's an opportunity here because I've always tried to blog as a beginner as somebody who's just learning new things and um, there's just a lot of awesome teachers out there who need encouragement. And I'm glad I can be one of those people who encourages and is helpful. Uh, so, um, you know, 10 years, I'm sure you've been through a whole roller coaster of blogging experiences. Uh, could you just give us maybe a couple of really amazing um, insights or accolades and maybe one or two horror stories? So, can we start with the positives? Huh, are you talking about, about blogging? Um, well, I think that um, the times that I have realized that uh, sharing and helping other people can change your own life, mm -hmm. uh, riding a camel in the Middle East, dune bashing in the Middle East, seeing the penguins in South Africa, riding a toboggan with my students uh, oh. down the Great Wall of China, uh, in Red Square in Moscow. Uh, All thanks to your blog. Uh, yeah, I've, I've really, you know, it's interesting. I was a, a business woman. I'm still a businesswoman, but went to Georgia Tech, had no plans to be a teacher. And when I became a teacher, um, I, I had people who said, well, you're not ever going to accomplish your dreams of, you know, writing, traveling, all those will just be gone. And truly teaching and then sharing and being helpful has, you know, I've traveled the world um, mm -hmm. and just have so many amazing memories of places. And, and every time I go to one of those places, I remember sitting in a tent in South Africa. It was the first time I was actually sent somewhere not to speak, but just as a blogger to cover uh, a conference. It was Microsoft uh, covering their, um, their global teachers conference. And I was in that tent and I was watching the beautiful um, uh, African singers and just everything going on. And I was like, okay, this is real. You know, when you get up at 5 a.m., as you know, Ross, and you're blogging or you're writing or you're doing all the sacrifices that you have to do to be helpful on an ongoing basis for this many years, mm -hmm. you think well, it's a kind of a lonely thing. But then yeah, when you get out and you meet people, you're like, well, this can change your life. And, you know, you don't start blogging because of traveling the world, but the goal is always, how can I help people? Yeah, and it's lovely when, uh, you know, you, you go on your travels and someone says, oh, I've read this, and, it, and you think, oh, I'm not, I'm not writing on my own. Someone actually benefits from this. Um, what? Give me a, a horror story, perhaps, uh, you know, maybe on your own workload or things like that. Are there any? I think, well, I would say, well, the workload, you know, can get you, but I would say the biggest horror story for me is that um, if it ever goes to your head, there have been a few times... Um, you, you can get pride, right? And not healthy pride. You can think that somehow you're the only one with the ideas or you're yes. the only one with the way to do things. And that, you know, the, the great proverb says, um, pride comes before a fall. And it truly does. Um, I think that keeping an attitude of understanding that we're a servant, we're a helper, we're an encourager. Mm -hmm. And when you get when you get um, over impressed with yourself, <laughs> nobody's going to be impressed. So I think that uh, the horror story has been my own flaws as I cope with uh, the changes, because here's the thing about it. Blogs come and go. And many, many years ago, I will say this, um, I had somebody I respected and admired so much. I will not say the person's name because I still respect and admire the person. And I kept noticing I would lose the ability to DM this person on Twitter 
it's like, what's up? Well, I had this person's phone number. So I messaged this person and said, well, what's up? I can't DM you on Twitter. And this, this hero of mine said, well, you have more followers than me now. And it just makes me feel bad. So I have to unfollow you just so that I can feel better about myself. And I was like, oh my goodness, I don't want to play King of the Hill. I want to make a bigger hill. You know, if I can find people, I love it when I have people on my podcast who've never been interviewed before. Mm -hmm. it's like, yes, I, this is an awesome person and they're going to go on and have an amazing career. And, and it may be a lot, quote, more than other people think I have. That, and if that's okay. Yeah. No, I like that analogy. You make yeah. a bigger hill so others can stand in it also. Um, yeah. Tell, tell listeners, uh, a brief synopsis of your kind of education life as a teacher, your career, where, 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 you've, where you've worked. Uh, this is year 19 for me in teaching. I have been a full-time teacher and IT director. I was at a small private school in South Georgia for uh, 16 years. Um, I loved that job. I loved that school. But very often people don't know what IT directors do. Yeah. So there was a period where I had um, no planning period. And I was IT director and they gave me something called prom here in the United States, which is a thing that the juniors do for the seniors, uh, the, the grade 11s do for the grade 12s. And it's not a fun thing to do if you're like me. I didn't even plan my wedding. My mom planned my wedding. So, uh, and, and I realized that that particular school, it was the workload was just killing me. Um, and there are people that don't, um, uh, root for you. Um, my friend Angela Myers calls it crab bucket mentality that the right. easiest way to keep a crab in the bucket is to have two in there. And I remember I was getting ready to go speak at the Berkman Center at Harvard. I was so excited that I had learned in my old school not to tell people. And again, I loved this school, but I had learned not to tell people because I would always catch grief. And I was in the front office turning in my lesson plans. And one of my colleagues came in who I, I care about and, and it just destroyed me with what she said. She said, oh, I hear you're going to Harvard. If you come back too big for your britches, we'll have to take you down a notch. So it, and I was just like, like, this is a dream. Like, be happy for me. Say, hey, I'm so glad somebody from our school can have this great opportunity. So I'm at a new school now, Sherwood Christian Academy in Albany, Georgia. Um, I make movies with my students. Uh, movie making has been a passion of mine now for about, I've, I've been making movies since 2006 with kids, but I've had some kids go on to do some incredible things. I mean, I have a student who's a first assistant director. He's done Stranger Things episodes. He's done, you know, Family Feud, hip hop things. And so this, this whole ability to craft a story, I think is mm -hmm. awesome. So um, I do that with kids. Uh, mm -hmm. My workload is is still heavy. Yeah, of course. But it's not. It's not like you have to teach seven straight classes with no planning period and yeah. fix two hundred computers. So what, what, what are the what are the pressures that you know you have, or you know the people that you kind of work with online for for teachers in Georgia in particular? What 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 you know the usual pressures on teachers as you're marking your assessment, you know all that type of admin. Is that the case where you are? I think the pressures on teachers are ubiquitous around the world. They are very uh, teachers. Um, and I do kind of think that this year, so many teachers have risen up to be remarkable teachers mm -hmm. that um, I do think that the respect of many of teachers has gone up because they see what's what's happening and the, in some ways, unreasonable expectations on teachers with, we want you to teach remotely to kids who are in trauma, who belong to parents who are in trauma, in a world in trauma, and we want you to keep up with everything, run your regular pace, um, and uh, it's just a difficult time right now, but you know, um, the, the pressures of teaching are always there, and it's the extra thing sometimes. It's that I'm not just a teacher. I'm also monitoring lunch. I'm also working with carpool. I'm also working with whatever clubs they've given me and, and all the mm -hmm. other things. So um, the pressures for teacher is that there's never enough time uh, to do all the things, and this is about kids. And mm -hmm. um, for me, a breakthrough happened really in my year two or three, or maybe even four of teaching, when I realized it's all about relationships. I always say you have to relate before you educate. So one reason I can get so much done in my classes, I don't like to give tests or homework, but we work the whole 53 minutes I have those students. 
And when we go online, they still work. I taught an awesome artificial intelligence course and interviewed some of the amazing people around the world who were experts in AI in the spring. Mm -hmm. We had to go the distance. And, but it's about relationship because they know that I care. I yeah. know them. I know who they are. And once you build those relationships, it's like a bridge of, of, mm -hmm. of, over which you can learn. You can walk across and learn together. Um you know, COVID aside, what 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 are the um, things that get teachers excited in Georgia at the moment? You know, for, for context here in England, we're very you know we love all the social media. It's not for everybody, but um, at least there's been a big explosion here in the UK for research informed practice. What what is it for teachers on your side of the pond? You know, I think it's almost right now impossible to put COVID aside because. Um, We've been trying a lot of places like my school. My school has been 15 weeks of in-person learning, uh, which is pretty remarkable. A lot of mm -hmm. schools can't do that. I think teachers right now just long to get back to the classroom and some sense of normalcy. That's what teachers are hoping for and longing for when it's when it's reasonable. Um, yeah, this is just such a hard time, Ross. It's if you we, if we had done this interview a a year ago. Mm -hmm. Um, I would have said that teachers got excited about things that could save them time yeah. and save them time with grading. Um, but you know, like teachers everywhere, there are a lot of things as you and I both know that can save teachers a whole lot of time, but because it's new, they think, well, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And I always show this, that we have this old thing called a mimeograph. I'm not sure what you call it over there. It's where okay. they used to mix the, the liquid and they would turn it and it would print out the test this was back in the 80s yeah and it was like a chemical reaction what we call, call it, it a, a band machine over here it's an old-fashioned photocopier isn't it yeah and and <laughs> what i tell teachers is that if you could do that there's absolutely nothing that you or i could teach them we're all said is harder than that because <laughs> that was like you had to be like that thing work you know um, but if we could just help them understand, help teachers understand that they can save time, uh -huh. that the tools like Nearpod or in Pear Deck are allow you to check for understanding every two to three minutes. Yeah. Like when you do that, you can teach things faster, more efficient. And mm -hmm. that quiz or that test should never be a surprise. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't say, oh my goodness, uh, half the class failed. You should already know if they know it before you ever test. That's what formative assessment's about. And that's what ed tech tools truly give us as well as a way to personalize in many ways. So, um but, you know, going down the ed tech route, um, w you know, would you define yourself as an expert or someone who's very curious and loves to explore new technologies? I would say that a lot of people call me an expert. <laughs> and um, but the, the thing is, is that who can truly be an expert? Because there's so many tools out there. I'm always learning about new tools. So I would say that I am an enthusiastic expert who's continually learning from other teachers Amen. and what are the insights from your blog you know all the teachers clicking and downloading and reading things what what kind of secrets or insights can you tell us what what are teacher habits well uh i think podcasts as you know are growing rapidly yeah, they are, um, yeah. a lot of folks are really starting to listen to that and understanding that's a part of their personal learning network that they can add i think teachers like lists they like simplicity mm -hmm. they like things that work they like to hear from other teachers. I think there's been sort of a pushback on quote thought leadership for people that haven't been in the classroom for a while, especially now. Um, in some ways, it's like if it was written before February 2020, it may be irrelevant. <laughs> so um, people are looking for current information about yes. how to cope with what they've got to do. Especially that remote um, teaching dialogue. Um, yeah. I I've spent much of my you know, my own lockdown experience, um, trying to understand the research in terms of technology. Um, how, how's lockdown been for you, Vicky? You know, the whole process? Well, um, we were, we were, I, I called it my at home sabbatical. Okay. So, cause lockdown just makes you feel like you're in prison and yes, it's true. you know, there's a good, good perspective. Yeah. So, um, we went, um, on uh, March 13th, and then I was back at work by mid-June, and we've been right. in person learning since then. 
Um, you know, I started making sourdough bread again. I started, um, at, I, but I worked. I worked from probably sometimes two and three in the morning to midnight. Yeah. Uh, we did not miss any days of instruction for distance learning. We took the whole school online, K3 through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. uh, went all the way through. Uh, we actually added an extra day of instruction. Uh, got rid of a day that was supposed to be a sort of vacation day. Um, it was very, very hard work. Mm -hmm. I hope I never have to do it again, <laughs> um, helping so many people get online and so many kids get online and, and truly learn and yeah. engage. We're all better. We're all questions. better prepared now, aren't we? Like you said we, we, earlier, we've done it. We've done it now and uh, it, it won't be so hard the second time. Well, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, you know, a lot of folks will say it was trauma teaching or it was emergency teaching in the spring. Our pedagogical approach needs to change because a lot of folks, what they did is, if, if as you're aware of the SAMR model, they just substituted. They said, okay, I lecture, so here's now I'm, I'm going to lecture. And then those who did that are kind of like, well, why is everybody turning their camera off? And when I call on them, why aren't they there? Well, it's because actually if you called on them in the classroom, that they wouldn't be there either because we know that we have to change things up to keep this generation interested. So the the weaknesses are even more apparent but the strengths are even more apparent too um mm -hmm. for my school we had no zoom wednesdays it had to be all online for for wednesday it had to be asynchronous and the teachers met for professional development mm -hmm. we met with mentor groups and we met with mastery groups so mentor groups are i'm sort of a lead teacher in a particular subject area say math and i'm going to help uh, the other math teachers do well in, in understand how i teach pedagogically online mastery groups were we would pick a tool so we'd say okay it's ed puzzle or it's nearpod or, you know we would pick experts in each of those areas who would then um the teachers could pick their mastery group mm -hmm. and their goal would be to master that particular technology and that by the end of their session they would have something created for the next day of class mm -hmm. so we leveled up very very quickly um i think my big concern is that that I, I'm not sure as a whole how many people are doing it extremely well. So there oh. are parents, you know, who are saying this is not teaching. My child is teaching themselves or, or whatever. Um, and so when we get back in person, the pendulum is going to swing and there are going to be schools that say we are 100% face-to-face in, -face instruction and we use no technology mm -hmm. because there is going to be a pushback. Um, but those who understand that remote learning is a permanent part of the landscape of learning and life on this planet mm -hmm. will understand that their children, that blended learning, as you know, you've looked at the research, blended learning works best face to face and online uh, compared to online have about the same success achievement rate you can kind of get there with both of those but when you truly advance exponentially it's when you have a face to face classroom that's augmented with a blended learning classroom with with an online and you got bricks and clicks as i often say in my bricks books and and writing I like that expression yep. um now you've written a, a, a book here or there. Could you uh, tell listeners, you know, where where your knowledge and, and where you've published some of your work? Blackening Classrooms, Engaging Minds. I co-wrote with a lady named Julie Lindsay, who's in uh, Australia, about how to globally collaborate. Uh, at this point, I've done more than or uh, led more than thirty global collaborative projects. The first is the Flat Classroom Project that was in Thomas Friedman's book, The World Is Flat, and actually. Um, you know, I had people say, you know, how did you know to go to distance learning? It's like, well, I actually pulled out flattening classrooms, engaging minds and followed my own advice on everything. And uh, because we had done it, if you can collaborate with Bangladesh, UK, Terry Friedman from the UK was one of our judges. Yeah, um, I know Terry advisors. very well. Yeah. Yes, he's a, an amazing friend of mine. I've actually been in the same place with him four or five times and he's remarkable. I love Terry. Um, but um, he, uh, so, so, I pulled that book out. The second book was Reinventing Writing. Uh -huh. uh, that was 2013, 2014. Uh, my children started graduating from high school, so that put me on a little hiatus. I'm actually working on uh, another book. I have a book called Do What Matters, which is an online book that you can only get from my site. And that's mm -hmm. um, sort of my productivity method of how am I able to do and so much. Listeners, cool cat teacher .com. 
Yes, coolcatteacher.com is my site and I'm cool cat teacher everywhere. <laughs> um, so, and then I'm working on it. I'm working on another one if I get through uh, this craziness right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask you about that in, in a moment. What, why cool cat teacher? Just out of interest. Well, back, uh, so I do have a marketing background and back when I was thinking of a name, um, name is everything. And Vicki Davis is a pretty common name. I actually have a sister-in-law named Vicki Davis. So, uh, you know, was, I've got to have something different. So, yeah. yeah. So I was brainstorming and writing down names and brainstorming and it was study hall with my students and um, mm -hmm. I was running ideas by them. And at the time, the, the mascot of my school was the wild cats. Uh -huh. And one of the teacher, one of the kids said, well, you're cool. So cool. why don't you be the cool cat? And I'm like, well, cool cat blog wouldn't work. So let's do cool cat teacher blog. And everybody was like, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. And right. like, okay, went home, husband loved it. And it's kind of like when you're brainstorming ideas, you, you, one will jump out. Like the 10 minute yeah. teacher was probably idea number 200, you yeah. know, when we were brainstorming podcast names. So, um, that's how long's the yeah. podcast been going for now? Podcast. Uh, so I had a podcast before called Every Classroom Matters, and um, that was on a network. And I wanted to self-produce and have, have my own show. And for most of the time, I've been five days a week on that particular podcast called The, the 10-Minute Teacher. Started that in February 2017. We're at episode 711 now. Wow. Um, and it's, you know, the, the thing is, is that as a teacher, I don't have 30 minutes or an hour no. to listen to a podcast. No. Um, I just don't. And so what I wanted to do was to have a really short podcast that teachers could get lots of different ideas as they mm -hmm. listen and then they could pick their ideas they want to go deeper into yeah it's a very good tip for myself because i you know i was trying to stick with 20 minutes and we've gone just above that and i know that uh you know my my blog in particular two or three minute reads max um so i know you're very you're speaking a lot of wisdom there so i'm going to try and make my podcast ah, the average person <laughs> listens to 12 minutes unless yeah. Unless they are a wild raving fan and just yeah, really that's true, uh, and, and they're rare. So on that note, Vicky, I'm gonna we've passed my 20 minute barrier. And <laughs> I, Nobody's I, listening. <laughs> no one's <laughs> listening to us now. Uh, but I, I'd like to just throw some quick fire questions at you and try and catch you off guard. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I haven't been doing very well recently, so I'll see how I get on. But um, and ideally, if you can't pause or hesitate and just blurt out the first response. Oh dear. <laughs> Um, so okay. let's just start with what project is on your desk today. Taking my dad to for skin cancer surgery. Mm. Okay, I'm sorry <laughs> to hear. Uh, we spoke uh, well, I mean, yeah, well, you can leave that in. I mean, I think that we yeah, yeah. No, that we'll definitely leave that in. I mean, it's the reality that sometimes, you know, I've all, I will say life gets in the way uh, when we're teachers. Teaching is hard enough, uh, but then life makes things harder. Um, what book are you reading? Oh, I have so many, but there's an, uh, one I downloaded this morning. It's uh, 50 writing. Oh, gosh. I need it. It's 50. <laughs> I wish I could remember it. Um, it's 50 writing. It'll come to you. Writing straight. Well, it's the name. Well, I was going to ask I next. Um, what's your top tips for writing a book? <laughs> My top tips for writing a book are uh, sit down and mind map the whole thing. And then go to index cards and kind of group them and then just get it out of your head the first yeah, time. Just right, get right it out. Right. And then you can go back and you can start revising. Um, the other thing is that don't get hung up on whether anybody is going to read it or not. Or don't start spending the money and deciding how you're going to go on a cruise. Because typically <laughs> most people don't get rich on books. No. But it's about leaving a legacy of helpfulness. And there are people who do get you and do appreciate you that will get a lot out of what you have to write. Uh, but writing is, I can't remember who, who said it, writing is just bleeding on a page. And yeah. it is. It's like your whole life. It's, a, it's very cathartic. Um, what, what, what ed tech tool are you still using 10 years later since you started blogging? Well, if it hadn't gotten rid of Wikispaces, it would have been <laughs> Wikispaces. <laughs> Um, I have been using Evernote a very long time. I've been using okay. WordPress a very long time. Twitter a very long and what, time. And what's your uh, what's your go to resource during lockdown? What couldn't you live without? Well, Google, well, Google Classroom was basically our our mm -hmm. classroom management system, but 
you know, app, yeah. puzzle, Zoom. <laughs> okay, uh, top number one app you would recommend to teachers to you to try? <laughs> Chrome. Chrome. <laughs> Google Chrome and know how to use extensions <laughs> and turn them on and off. Uh, that's a big thing. The teachers start getting into all these tools and they don't know how to turn their extensions on and off and they start conflicting with each other and slowing things down. So just learn, like start off by learning how to use your Chrome web browser and then go into other tools that are that are awesome. I think Nearpod is a great tool too. Mm -hmm. um, if you weren't a teacher, you know, assuming teaching and podcasting and blogging is your dream job, what, what is that off the wall career you never had? Well, probably if I ever stop teaching, it will be just writing books full time. I've got um, some nonfiction and some fiction books that I've worked on for years and uh, mm -hmm. that and just doing doing this blog podcast thing, um, be on the radio <laughs> or I don't know, right. but create um, and invent. Give me three words your students would just use to describe you, your teaching. <laughs> uh, intense um truthful uh -huh. one more and hilarious <laughs> <laughs> excellent who would you recommend i interview next and why my friend casey bell from shake up learning i love her all right i've, I've not heard awesome. i've not met casey so it'd be nice to uh, get get connected and finally um where can listeners find out more about you vicky you know your blogs links podcasts coolcatteacher.com Okay, very simple. My final question, I ask all my uh, people I work with, um, what would you hope to be your legacy? A legacy of helpfulness that when people look back and if they can read my content in 100 years, they say that she understood the heart of teaching and she did not let ed tech tools or the new stuff obscure the fact that it is about a relationship between teachers and students and that when a teacher truly connects with kids, and they can change their lives and they can change the future of the planet. And I hope that I have a lot of kids all over the world who are repeating that they can be world-class and how to treat others with respect, even people's different than them. And um, that they, that they saw a teacher who just mm -hmm. lived life to the full and didn't right. hold back and had no regrets. Fantastic. Um, well, Vicki, uh, firstly, it's been wonderful to connect with you. Uh, let's not leave it 10 years again. And uh, can, I, can I just uh, also say the reason we got in touch is we were both shortlisted for the LinkedIn Top Voices. So congratulations yeah. to you also. And for people listening, uh, your podcast, 10 Minute Teacher, um, yes. and your website, coolcatteacher.com. Uh, thank you for all the things that you do to inspire the teaching profession. And uh, thank you for your time and keep up the good work. You too, very much so. Thank you, Vicky.